Before we get started, a couple logistical things. Um, homework zero is due tonight uh, at 11.59. Uh, homework one has also been posted now, and it will be due on Wednesday next week. We are also going to be posting a number of resources for your project today. Uh, first, we're going to be posting a number of project ideas. Uh, so if you're not sure what to work on and you want some ideas, uh, that should be pretty helpful. We're also going to post some example projects from last year that could give you a little bit of a flavor of the kinds of things that have done, people have done for the class in the past. Uh, and then lastly, um, some people mentioned that they'd love some help connecting with others in the class that have similar interests. And so we're also going to be posting a form that allows you to kind of put down your interests and whether or not you're looking for uh, project collaborators. And we'll also post the responses to that form today as well. And so it'll just help you connect with people who have similar interests. Um, this is an optional form. Uh, it's more just to help you find people if you're looking for people to work with. Um, one other important note as well um, on logistics is that uh, these days there are some pretty fancy AI-based code completion tools like GitHub, um, actually, co sorry, that's a typo, Copilot. Um, there's also a, a more recent one that's even open source. Um, there aren't, these are pretty new, and so there aren't a lot of kind of standard course policies around using these tools. Um, we'd like to say that it's okay for you to use these kind of things for the project, uh, but we'd uh, say that it's not okay for using it for the assignments, because the assignments should, you should really be able to understand um, the code that you're writing rather than trying to ask uh, an AI to do your homework for you. Um, cool, and then the last um, logistical item also as well is that um, your feedback is really important to helping us help you uh, to make sure the class is a great experience for you. And so one thing that we're gonna be doing is called high resolution feedback uh, starting this week. And it'll, every, um, every week, a random subset of the class will be getting a form, a feedback form, where you can tell us how things are going um, and so forth. And we'll use this to improve the class. So not all of you will get this this week. Um, it will be a different subset every week. Uh, so that we're not putting a ton of burden on you to fill out surveys every single week, but we can also still get um, feedback throughout the course. Great, um, and then lastly, we've also finalized the guest lectures for the end of the course. Uh, I'm really excited that we'll have um, Hani and Percy give guest lectures. Um, Hani is at, at Google. She does a lot of really cool work on transfer learning and understanding deep learning. And Percy is here at Stanford, and he does a lot of work on foundation models, natural language processing, um, and understanding emergent few-shot learning. Um, so I'm excited to, to see those lectures at the end of the course. Great, um, so those are all the logistics. Uh, any, any questions on all that? So a lot, um, all of this is on, well, these things are on the course website. Um, the project resources will be posted on Ed. So um, yeah, nothing is only here. Awesome, um, so last lecture on Wednesday last week, um, we talked about multitask learning. And we defined what a task is as a set of data generating distributions from which a training set and a test set is sampled. Um, the task also has a corresponding loss function. Um, and we didn't explicitly cover this, but you can think of learning a task as essentially taking as input a data set and predicting a set of parameters. Um, and those parameters would be the parameters of your model. Um, we also talked about multitask learning where we're gonna be training a neural network that's conditioned on a description of the task, Z, and is going to be making predictions for inputs given that descriptor of the task. Uh, we talked about how basically the choice of conditioning on Z in different ways affects how the parameters are shared and different design choices with respect to that choice. So if you observe negative transfer, you might consider sharing less information and designing architectures and designing ways to condition on Z that affect that. Uh, and likewise, if you observe overfitting, you may want to uh, try sharing more and have more shared parameters. Um, lastly, we also talked about this objective function for multitask learning and how um, if you normalize your labels, then just adding up the losses and optimizing like that is a great choice. Uh, but you may also want to choose the task weightings in a way that affects the prioritization of the tasks. Great, so that's a brief recap of Wednesday's lecture. Now, um, the plan for today is we're going to talk about transfer learning um, and the problem formulation of that. Uh, and then we're going to actually start talking about meta-learning and the problem formulation and the way that we can think about what meta-learning actually is. 
Um, this will actually get into the start of homework one, and the lecture on Wednesday will kind of cover the rest of the content that's needed for completing homework one. Um, cool, and then from there, uh, the cool things that we'll talk, cover today in terms of learning goals are thinking about how you can transfer things from one task to another task. Um, what does it mean for multiple tasks to have some sort of shared structure, which is this somewhat nebulous notion that we've been talking about for uh, the last week. And also, what is meta-learning? Awesome, so let's get started by talking about transfer learning. So um, in lecture before, we talked about trying to solve multiple tasks at once. And in transfer learning, things are a little bit different. So in transfer learning, our goal is typically to solve a particular target task after having previously solved a source task or a set of source tasks. And the goal here is when we so try to solve the, um, this target task, we want to transfer some of what was learned on task A when trying to solve task B. Um, and a common assumption here is that typically you can't access the data from task A when you're trying to solve task B. Uh, and so you basically want to condense all your information or knowledge about task A into some parameters and then use that condensed knowledge into, um, when trying to address task B. Um, now it's worth mentioning here that uh, transfer learning, you can think of it as a valid solution to multitask learning because if you want to learn two tasks, then you could learn task one and then transfer that to more effectively learn task two. That will give you a solution to task one and task two. Um, however, because of this pretty common assumption, um, multitask learning is not usually thought of as a valid solution to transfer learning because uh, you can't access the data um, for one of the tasks during the transfer process. So you don't access uh, the data sets of the two tasks at the same time. Cool, um, so from there I have a question for you. Um, so now that I've introduced these two problem statements, I'm curious um, if you have some ideas for what kinds of problems um, you might run into where transfer learning might make a lot of sense and might make more sense than running multitask learning. Yeah. Um, your source task has way more data than your target task. Yeah, so if your source task has a, has a ton of data, um, then you don't want to have to keep this around and like retrain on it when you're solving task B. You want to condense that knowledge down and try to transfer it. So that's one setting where you might want to use transfer learning. Other scenarios? Yeah. Your, your second task may not have a lot of data associated with it, so you want the learnings from the previous tasks to focus all that. Yeah, so if you don't have a lot of tasks, a lot of data for your target task, then um, something like transfer learning might make sense there. I also think that something like multitask learning could probably also be applicable to that sort of setting as well. Um, but it is a setting where, where transfer learning is often um, is often used. Uh, yeah. And has to be have some uh, strong uh, uh, correlate relationships. For example, when you want to locate some object in the image, maybe versus you need to uh, recognize or identify it. So then the translation can be task A, then location can be task B, something like that. Yeah, so if the tasks have a lot of shared structure, um, that may also be a good scenario to use transfer learning, and, and also a scenario where multitask learning might apply. Um, yeah? Um, the ways of task A are readily available, so you don't have to read on the training. Yeah, exactly. So if you've already learned task A and the weights you can just download from the internet, maybe maybe you haven't trained it yourself, maybe someone else did and they put their weights on the internet, then you don't even actually have to solve task A. You can just take their weights, take their solution, um, and use that for task B. And so that's um, another scenario where it's very commonly used. Um, one more. Maybe you're deploying this into an environment where you don't have the capacity to learn very much because you're there but only then will you understand what task B really is. Yeah, exactly. So you might be in a scenario where you don't, um, you don't know what, ta what all the tasks are up front. You're in a scenario where maybe you want to very quickly adapt to a new task. Maybe you're trying to adapt to, um, like on a cell phone, for example, for, to a particular user. Um, in that sort of scenario, it's um, something like transfer learning makes a lot of sense. Cool. Um, so those are like, yeah, lots of really, really great examples. Um, I had a couple examples that I put on the slide. The first was mentioned, if you have a really large source data set, you don't want to have to retain this and retrain on it with multitask learning. Um, 
And then the second ca uh, case that I mentioned uh, is you may actually have a scenario where you don't actually care about solving both of the tasks simultaneously. Uh, for example, um, if ultimately you, your goal is to, to kind of deploy a model on, on different people's phones, you don't need to have a model that works for everyone um, at the same time. You just need to be able to adapt the model to a user um, at any particular point in time. Yeah. Uh, uh, do we, uh, when we do machine learning, uh, are you on the assumption we can uh, usually assume the more access and then on the data set DA, right? Now, uh, what we will have just the, I mean, weights off in the model A? Yeah, typically what you will have about task A is something like the weights um, or something that, that you learned. You, it could be more than the weights. Maybe you have some information about um, the optimizer, for example, that maybe you have stored. Um, but typically, it, it's the weights that you um, have trained on task A. Cool. Um, so now that we've talked about the problem setup, uh, we'll talk about fine tuning, which is basically the, the go-to approach for, for transfer learning. And the way that fine tuning works is we'll take the weights that were trained on task A. I, I'll denote this with theta. And we will initialize a neural network with those weights and then run gradient descent on the target task, initialized at those weights. Um, and so if dtrain is the training data for your new task, then you'll evaluate the gradient, um, apply that gradient uh, at the network initialized at theta. This is showing just one step of gradient descent, but in practice you would typically do this for um, a number of gradient steps. And then the result of this process is you'll get a set of parameters phi that uh, are hopefully actually much better at task B than if you were to randomly initialize theta. And in fact, if you actually compare ra using randomly initialized parameters versus parameters pre-initialized with a data set that um, is effective, is, is useful for the target task, uh, we can see that we get much better performance. So in particular, here's an example where a neural network is pre-trained on ImageNet, or it is initialized randomly. And the target data set is um, these two data sets, Pascal and Sun, which are both image recognition data sets. And we see that uh, we're able to do remarkably better if we pre-train on ImageNet compared to pre-training from scratch. Um, on the order of like 16% to 17%. Uh, so this is really cool. Uh, essentially what this is doing is that it's taking all the in, like, rich information that exists in the ImageNet data set, leveraging that in the context of uh, transferring to these new tasks. Yeah. Transfer learning doesn't make sense between two tasks. Like, uh, I have the uh, feedback set and smooth set. So, like, how do I look at the both tasks if transfer learning can work on? Is there some criteria? Or something? Yeah. So the question is, um, is there some criterion that could tell us uh, if transfer learning will work, if it will be helpful? Uh, and in general, kind of similar to the multitask learning scenario, where it's difficult to tell if training on two tasks together will be helpful. Um, it's also very difficult to just develop some criterion. And so in general, um, there are some kind of general common wisdom for getting these, these things to work well. Um, and in general, um, for example, if intuitively the tasks seem related, then, um, then it could be a good choice. But in practice, there isn't any, any hard rule that will tell us if it will work or not. Um, and so I guess I should say that what I just said is, is dissatisfying to me. I think it'd be really awesome if we had something that could tell us basically whether this would work. And um, we'll talk a little bit about some recent research in some of the coming slides, uh, but also investigating this sort of thing for like a course project, I think um, could be quite interesting. Yeah. Um, uh, so in this case, are you retraining all, all the layers? Um, the yeah, so in this case, um, we're retraining the entire parameter vector. Um, I guess I'll try to finish this slide and then we can get to more questions. So um, kind of related to like, um, when will this work, when will this not work? Uh, there's a number of choices that you can select for the pre-trained parameters. Um, things like ImageNet classification or models trained on a very large language corpora are, are common choices in computer vision and NLP. Uh, and in general, if you can pre-train on, on a diverse data set that covers the kinds of data that you'll be seeing during fine-tuning, um, uh, that's kind of generally a good choice. 
Uh, it doesn't even need to necessarily cover the, um, cover the distribution of what you'll see at test time. So uh, for example, in image net classification, people have found that you actually get very general purpose visual features from those. And you can take those visual features and actually apply it to um, try to transfer them to satellite images or try to transfer them to medical images. And those visual features are actually still pretty useful, even though those images are out of distribution compared to what image net images look like. Yeah. Do it if you think that this is doing something like creating a dictionary of latent variables? It's an approximate dictionary, and then fine tuning is basically updating the dictionary a little bit. Yeah, so the question is can we think of this as um, the pre training process is learning a dictionary of latent variables, and then the fine tuning process is essentially um, as updating the. Um, I guess I'm not fully sure what fixing it towards a task exactly means. I mean, the, I think that intuitively there's, a, I guess, I think there's a, a lot of intuitive explanations for what it may be doing. Um, one intuitive explanation is that it's giving you good features. So it's giving you uh, a good representation of images, for example. It gives you a good way to look at images or a good way to read text. Um, so that's one ex explanation. And once you have once you kind of roughly know how to see at a course level, then that makes it much easier to be able to recognize other images. Um, and then a completely separate explanation might be if you think about from the standpoint of optimization, if you have this really complex optimization landscape that is non-convex, then you can possibly think of this as trying to put you in the right basin of that optimization landscape. And once you're in the right basin, then if you run gradient descent from that basin, you'll get to a better solution than if you uh, started off kind of at a random spot in that optimization or in that landscape. Yeah. Uh, so can this be related to the idea where you have a simple model, learn that model, um, and then initialize a more complex model with weights learned from the simpler model? Or does this fall outside that paradigm? So starting with a simple model and going towards a more complex model. So um, in general, something like that I would uh, refer to as perhaps a form of curriculum learning where you move from kind of simpler tasks towards more and more difficult tasks. And things like transfer learning can be applied to that, but that doesn't always have to be the case. You don't have to start with a simple task and move to a more complex task. Uh, in fact, oftentimes you actually move from a more complex task to a simpler one. Like image net classification is actually a really, really hard task to learn from scratch. Uh, and then you might move to something that's a little bit simpler. Like maybe you want to be able to classify between like cats and dogs or something like that. Yeah. So if you have a large enough data set, then could it make sense to pre-train a model from scratch? Or do you think that fine tuning would generally maybe still provide some benefits? Yeah, so if you have a large enough data set, does pre-training make sense or can you just train from scratch? Um, if you do have a large data set, then uh, it's from a performance standpoint, it may be that you can already do quite well training from scratch on that large data set. Um, there are still some potential benefits. One very obvious potential benefit is that you may, um, you may not need as much compute to get to the solution. So even if you have a large data set, um, if you can initialize with the pre-trained model, then you may need many fewer gradient steps to, and many fewer compute cycles to get to a good solution on that task compared to if you were to train without any prior knowledge. Um, cool. So um, kind of the common wisdom with these pre-trained models is generally trying to pre-train on diverse data sets. Um, there's also some unsupervised learning techniques that you can use for pre-training, uh, and we'll cover those in some of the upcoming lectures. Yeah. Should we consider that the task, the new task is related to the old task, or the new data set is related to the large data set that we have? I mean, is, it, is, is the relation based on the type of the data or the type of the task? Yeah, so the question was, um, like, generally, we'll, this may be part of the answer too, but um, generally we want the tar source task and target task to be similar, to be related to one another. Um, and you were asking if it, they need to be related in terms of what task it is versus what the data is. And in reality, it's both. It's both what the data looks like and what you're trying to do with that data um, that will affect how successful transfer is. I'm going to move on a little bit to get, at least get to the, the rest of this slide. So, uh, but all these are great questions. Um, now, one of the things that was mentioned before is that uh, 
one of the things that's really awesome about transfer learning is it's not just that you can do better by leveraging this prior knowledge, but that oftentimes someone has already distilled that prior knowledge into a model and put that model on the internet uh, so that you don't even have to uh, train on ImageNet or train on some, some language corpora. And this actually significantly improves, I think, the accessibility of, of things like deep learning because it means that anyone can download a model and use it on, on, on their problem on their data set as long as it's um, at least somewhat sufficiently similar to these common pre-trained models. Cool. Um, now, in this example, we, this is kind of the, I think the, one of the most common versions of fine tuning where you fine tune the entire network. But in practice, there's actually a lot of different design choices that come up when thinking about fine tuning. And a lot of these design choices kind of revolve around thinking about how to not destroy the prior knowledge and prior information in your model and balance that prior knowledge with the knowledge from your new data set. Uh, and in particular, if you have a neural network um, that, uh, that has some layers, um, say, for example, you, um, maybe you're trying to pre-train on ImageNet and now you're uh, trying to fine tune on a task like classifying between cats and dogs. Um, or maybe, I think cats and dogs are probably in the ImageNet data set, so we can maybe pick something more obscure uh, like, I don't know, classifying between um, whiteboard markers and whiteboard erasers or something like that. Um, in that case, uh, you have a, a network pre-trained on ImageNet, and um, the output, ImageNet has a thousand classes, and so the output layer is going to be a thousand dimensional, and your target task has two possible labels, one for whiteboard markers and one for whiteboard erasers. And so what you need to do in that case is to essentially kind of reinitialize the last layer, because you can't, or, or at least use some part of this, um, you, you can't just directly use this last thing. You could either use two of the classes and then throw away the, la the last half, or just reinitialize a new network on top of these features right here. Now one thing that comes up is, let's say you reinitialize to instead have um, a last layer of two, uh, a much smaller last layer, uh, and these are now randomly initialized weights, whereas everything before this is weights pre-trained on ImageNet. Now in that case, if you backpropagate your gradients through the network, if this is a randomly initialized weight matrix, then you're essentially gonna be multiplying your gradients by some random numbers right here, and then applying those gradients to the rest of the network. And so then you're gonna be hitting um, these weight matrices with numbers that have a lot more randomness in them, and that might actually destroy a lot of the really great information in these layers. And so one common practice, um, or there's a few different common practices for people um, that, that people do. Um, one is to fine tune with a smaller learning rate, especially for the earlier layers of the network, because you don't want these, these features to be destroyed by the gradients coming in from the network. Um, smaller learning rate for earlier layers. Um, sometimes also you might freeze these earlier layers and only train the latter parts of the network, um, or only train, start by only training the gradual part, the, the last parts of the network and gradually unfreeze from the back of the network. Um, Reinitialize the last layer, which we talked about. Um, so I guess these four things are, are, are fairly common design choices when fine tuning. In terms of how to pick between those design choices, um, you can kind of search over those design choices and hyperparameters by running cross-validation uh, on your target task. Um, and I guess the last thing worth mentioning here is that the architecture that you choose to fine tune will also affect the transfer performance. And so in particular, um, residual networks, which have residual connections between layers, um, these networks are often more effective for fine tuning because you get kind of a, a bit of a highway um, throughout the network, and so you, uh, it's easier, easier to get, get gradients to, um, to all of the layers rather than having to um, use the chain, well, rather than having to kind of go one by one by layer. Okay, um, so now that we've gone over the basics of fine tuning, are there any more questions? Yeah. Um, with that, with like these design choices depending on the complexity of that second transfer learning task, so let's say it's just you know cats versus dogs. Maybe all you would need to do is um, a simpler change to that last layer, right? 
But if it's a really complicated sequence, then you may be in the entry. Yeah, absolutely. So um, the, task, the question was, like, if the target task is simple versus complex, does that affect the, um, the, how, how you choose to fine tune the network? And yeah, if you have a really simple task, then you may just only need to train this last layer. You may not even need to change the features at all, especially if that task is very related to the source task. Whereas if it's very complex or very different, you may want to actually kind of reinitialize more than one layer on top of the features um, or kind of fine tune the entire network or, or something like that. Yeah. If you don't have much data for task B, how do you prevent overfitting on that data? Like, is there a principal way of doing regularity? Yeah, so if we have a small amount of data, how do we prevent overfitting? Um, the most common thing to do is early stopping, which is also done in standard machine learning, which is instead of fine tuning this for a very long time, fine tune it for fewer gradient steps, watch your validation loss on your target task, and stop fine tuning once you reach a good solution. Um, you can also fine tune fewer layers as well. So if you fine tune only the last layer, then you'll probably overfit less than if you fine tune the whole network. Yeah. Just out of curiosity, if you took like a pre-trained model, like ImageNet, for example, and were to fine tune it on more exotic sort of, more like more specific instantiations of certain objects or categories, um, would the network still sort of show um, like semantic understanding of like semantic distinctions between yeah, so the question is, if you fine tune on a more fine grained classification task, like maybe classifying between different species of birds or something like that, then would the features still, like, would you get um, a, a good feature space for that task such that like similar species of birds are grouped together? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, so um, if you fine tune only the last layer of the network, that won't affect the features in any way, and so you'll just get the original ImageNet features. But if you do fine tune the entire network, then that should also give you better features for that target task. Of course, if you have a really small target task, then the features, um, you may not benefit, well, you may overfit to that, and so you may not get good features of that, or it may just be beneficial not to fine tune for very long because you have a small data set. So, it will depend a bit on your data set size, but if you fine tune the whole thing, it will adjust the features and, and it should learn a good, um, a good space for, for that, a good set of features. Yeah. Uh, what's in the notation of the, uh, what, what is the notation like in the arrow? Is it a new loss function for the new task? Yeah, so the arrow on the left, it is kind of an assignment operation. So we're saying that we're defining theta, we're defining phi to be um, to be the right hand side of that. You can th sort of think of it as an equal sign, although um, it's more directional. Okay, so, so we need to move the parameter from the first mode of the first task to the mode of the second task. They're using the new loss function on the new training data yeah. and do the gradient descent. The fine is the uh, the the, per, the trend per parameter of the second part. Right? Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Then in this case, um, it means that uh, seems that the two models should have should have the same architecture. Right? Yeah, yeah. So when you fine tune, um, you're going to be if you fine tune the whole network. You, well, in general, you should be using the same architecture. You can reinitialize the last layer or reinitialize parts of the network and change that part of the architecture. Uh, but in general, especially the first layers, um, will need to have the, the same architecture. How we initialize the uh, parameter in the uh, on the same last layer just randomize or something? Yeah. So if you have more layers, then you'll need to randomly initialize. Though there there isn't a great way to initialize them. Also use transfer learning for multitasks, uh, but just by separating the last few layers. Yeah, so you could also um, you could also transfer to multiple different downstream tasks. So you could have like a mul like multiple heads, for example, or you could pass in a Z here. Um, one thing that's a little bit tricky is if you want to pass in a Z earlier in the network or pass in some other input earlier into the network that wasn't there during pre-training, then you need to make sure that you kind of actually update this layer during fine tuning. Um, but in general, something like that is definitely possible. Cool, was there one more question in the back? Yeah. Uh, so if you have the source data available on which the model was taken, 
Does it help in accounting for the domain shift? So, if you have a closed data variable for the pre-trained model, are there any methods to, like, we could do multitask learning for this particular fine tuning uh, to also account for domain shift on top of what the task we're training for? So you're asking if we have the source data available, is that helpful during the fine tuning process? So in general, so you could just do multitask learning and train on both of the tasks and maybe upweight the target task if you care more about that. Um, that can be helpful if you don't want to forget the source task. Um, it can be somewhat helpful to regularize when trying to solve the target task, although in practice, um, it. It depends a little bit on the scenario, and in practice, actually, just often, fi oftentimes, fine tuning is actually often better than keeping it around. The other thing that you can do is you can regularize towards the initial parameters, and that you can do actually without the source data, which is nice. And um, there are some works that have found benefits for that in some scenarios. Yeah. So, if you're working in some sort of few shot regime, is there has there ever been has there been shown like any way to sort of do a full fine tuning that isn't just like explicitly worse than linear evaluation. Um, in so you're asking in, in the setting where you have a very small amount of target data, is it ever better to fine tune the entire network rather than just a small thing on top? Like just the final layer, yeah. Um, I'll, in two slides, I'll get to something that I think will s somewhat it won't fully address that, but it will show some scenarios where, that are better than just fine-tuning the last layer. Um, yeah. OK. So I've gone, in general, all the things on this slide are, I would ref, or all the things on the bottom I would refer to as kind of common wisdom around fine-tuning. Uh, and it's also worth mentioning that this common wisdom, I think, is changing, uh, and it's not not fully set in stone. And so in particular, uh, on these next two slides, I want to cover uh, two, uh, two papers that uh, maybe you might consider as old by machine learning standpoint, um, for, for, by machine learning terms, which is that uh, they both came out last week. <laughs> and um, the first paper um, is a paper by some folks um, at, uh, at CMU, I believe. And they found that actually that unsupervised or generally pre-training doesn't necessarily need a really diverse data set, um, specifically unsupervised pre-training methods. And so um, they found that if you randomly initialize the network, you get 72% success on the target task. If you pre-train on, um, on a book corpus that's much larger, you get 81%. So we, we do see a benefit from pre-training here. Um, but they also found that if you pre-train with this unsupervised objective, on the fine-tuning data set, uh, you actually get 80.96% success or, or average accuracy, which is actually very close to the 81.3. And this, I think, breaks the common wisdom because the common wisdom is that typically we need a very diverse pre-training data set. And this suggests that when you have an unsupervised pre-training objective, you may not actually need a really diverse pre-training objective or pre-training data set. You could possibly even just pre-train on the target data set itself. Um, so this is kind of breaking the common knowledge or the common wisdom here. Um, if you have a supervised pre-training task, then this won't work out because you like running supervised learning on your fine-tuning data set and then running fine-tuning on your fine-tuning data set, those are going to be the same exact thing. Um, so this is, I would expect to only hold in the unsupervised pre-training case, um, but it's something that that breaks the common wisdom and suggests that we don't um, have everything figured out, even when it comes to fine tuning. Yeah. This is only in stages versus. Can you opt? Um, with this, you're asking if this would also hold in the multitask so setting. I see. I think that they only ran experiments in the pre-training and fine-tuning phase, but um, you could read the paper for to check. Um, and because it came out last week, I don't think anyone has built on it yet. I should mention that this is averaged over a number of different. Um, they ran this this on a number of different target tasks. Um, this was all in the NLP domain, um, but there's actually another paper that um, came out actually a little bit before this that actually showed a similar result 
in uh, computer vision tasks as well. Um, now, the second paper um, is actually a paper um, that was co-authored by Yunho and, and, and others. Um, Yunho is a, a TA in the class. Uh, he looks like this. And uh, I want to give a little bit of the kind of the thought process behind the research, because um, I said I would try to mention that a little bit in the course. And the thought process was that there's a lot of scenarios where fine-tuning only the last layer works really well. Um, so that's great. But um, is there anything actually like that special about the last layer? Um, you can maybe think that it's somewhat special and that it's kind of closest to the labels in some sense, but um, in many ways it's also just like any other layer in the neural network. And so his thought process was, well, um, maybe for kind of, if we're trying to fine tune to a pretty low level shift, maybe there are scenarios where the last layer wouldn't work better, but actually maybe other layers in the network like the first layer might actually work better. Um, and he actually already had something, some experiments set up to run fine tuning on um, image corruptions, and so he pre-trained on the CIFAR, um, CIFAR 10 data set, which is an image classification data set, fine-tuned it on um, CIFAR 10C, which is a, a corrupted version of that data set, where there are small low-level image corruptions applied to the data, and he found that if you fine-tune the, the whole network, you get around 79.9% accuracy, and if you fine-tune only the first layer of the network, you get a higher accuracy on the target task. Um, and then from there, the thought process was, well, okay, if there's some scenarios where the first layer works, maybe there are scenarios where some, like, only fine-tuning the middle layer works. Um, and indeed, there are some scenarios where actually fine-tuning a middle layer is actually better than fine-tuning the whole network. Um, and so this is another example of kind of breaking the common wisdom, because the common wisdom is typically to fine-tune from the back of the network, but there are actually scenarios where that's not the best option. Of course, these differences are, are still, um, they're kind of 2 to 4%, so full fine-tuning still does work pretty well in practice, uh, but it just suggests that we don't have a full understanding of fine-tuning. Yeah? Um, I was just wondering how the these layers might have different numbers of parameters, how that could be integrated into this sort of analysis, or how they you know, correct for that. In, in comparing the events of... Yeah. So the question is that different layers have different numbers of parameters, and so it may be that, like, uh, maybe that is accounting for some of the differences here. Maybe that has like a regularizing effect or something like that. Um, in general, I, I cannot remember off the top of my head the numbers of parameters for each of these blocks. Um, but the, um, they did run experiments fairly extensively on this. Um, they weren't explicitly controlling for the number of parameters, but um, the results I do think suggested that it had more to do with where in the network you were fine tuning compared to um, the number of parameters, and I, I guess I should also mention that for full fine tuning, um, the learning rate and um, the early stopping were both determined with cross validation, and so this is a very this is like a pretty well tuned baseline. Yeah. So, so I was thinking for for uh, for some tasks tasks like the ImageNet data set where we start off with a with like a color uh, image as the input, and we now want a task where we just have uh, black and white. Um, it would make sense to just uh, retrain the first layer because it's like a, it's a change in like the, the inputs, but we still want to do like a fundamentally similar like processing. Yeah. Um, is there like any good intuition for how, for, for when we would choose like a middle layer and which middle layer to choose? Yeah. So the question is, um, yeah, like what's what's the, some of the intuition here, especially with regard to the middle layers? Um, and so, in some of Yunho's intuition for trying this also was that um, you could sort of think of so there's sort of a kind of a causal process underlying kind of the process of going from a label to generate an image. And you could sort of think of neural networks as trying to reverse that causal process. Uh, where like when you are, for example, trying to um, generate, I think like this one, you're trying to predict vegetables, for example, you may first go from um, the whether it's a vegetable or not to something that's like what, what type of vegetable is it to like what is the position of those vegetables and the appearance of that vegetable and then down to like what do pixels look like for that kind of thing. Um, and when you change some part of that causal process, it, if you think of that as the entire chain, it could be that maybe if you change, some, change something in the middle of that chain, then fine tuning the middle parts of the network might be the best choice insofar as neural networks might be kind of reversing the causal process of, of image generation. Um, so that, that was some of our intuition there, um, but it's also something that is, isn't like still fully sorted out. And I think that 
one of the things that, that makes this result interesting is that it is different for different kinds of, of shifts between source and target. Yeah. Uh, bridge that, I mean, uh, the full, uh, like, so the fine tuning of one layer somewhere in the network works better than full fine tuning, but was it also compared that it works better than just fine tuning the last layer as well? Yeah, yeah, so in these cases, it was also, uh, well, in this case, it, the last layer was best, but um, in the first two cases, these were also better than fine tuning just the last layer. Yeah. Like, like, level of corruption is low level. So, in, in, let's say, say part NC, is it better for all the 15 different types of corruptions, or does it even like decrease for some like, specific corruption? Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. So the question is: Is it um, helpful? Is the first layer good for all different kinds of corruptions? Um, I, I believe it was better for the, um, for. Almost all of the corruptions that we tried. Um, I don't think I'm not sure if we tried all 30 of them. I think there's there's a lot of them, um, but I think that for at least for most of the ones that we tried, it was the best. Yeah. Cool. Um, okay. So now that we know that the common wisdom is well, the common wisdom is okay, but it's uh, it's still something that's kind of being developed. Um, I do want to give you somewhat of a default because um, if you if you do want to actually use fine tuning in practice. Uh, you don't want to have to navigate this entire space of des design choices. And so um, despite some of the results that we've seen, um, I do think that if you want something that is pretty reliable, I think something like first training the last layer of the network and then training the whole thing um, is, is generally um, a really good place to start and generally works well in practice. Um, and the reason for that is exactly what we talked about before, where um, you don't want to you want to avoid d destroying your early features, and so you want to train these this last layer, the last set of layers first, um, and then fine tuning the whole thing usually is um, is helpful in practice. Yeah. How do you know when to stop training the last layer and then go into fine tuning? It? Yeah. So in terms of when to stop training the last layer, um, typically when you train the last layer, you typically don't overfit because it's a pretty small number of parameters. Um, and so you can mostly just look at until you converge. Um, and then once you roughly converge, once you see the loss function not going down anymore, um, you can start uh, fine tuning the whole layer. You can also look at when the validation loss starts to even, uh, starts to level out as well. Cool, yeah. Would that approach be a would this be applicable to online learning? Um, yeah, I mean, you could certainly kind of do this repeatedly, like reinitialize the, the last layer and fine tune that before fine tuning the whole thing and then kind of do that repeatedly. Yeah, um, although I, if you see, are seeing kind of a gradual shift in an online learning setting, you may just want to keep on fine tuning the whole network. Cool, um, and then the last thing that we'll talk about with fine tuning is that, um, is looking at what fine tuning performance looks like when you have varying amounts of target task data. Um, and this is just one example. Um, and so in, in particular, what this is looking at is the x-axis is the number of training examples in your target data set. And the y-axis is, um, is the error, the validation error rate on that target task. And so as we see, as we have more target task data, um, the better we do, as we would expect. Um, the blue line is training from scratch. Um, the green and orange line are different, um, different pre-trained models. And one thing we note is that if we have only 100 target task um, data points, uh, the performance isn't, isn't nearly as good as if we had a bit more than that. Um, and in general, these are, this is still doing pretty good. Like in this example, we only have like, if we, if we only have 1,000 examples, we still do really, really well. Um, but it, it does start to get much worse if we have only 100 examples. Um, and this is where things like meta learning can can be useful. Cool. Um, so now let's, with that in mind, let's transition to talking about meta learning. So, how do we get from transfer learning to meta learning? Um, in transfer learning, we talked about how we'll initialize the model and hope that initializing from there helps on the target task. Um, the kind of key intuition behind meta learning is instead of hoping that it, it will help. What if we explicitly optimize for transferability? Um, and what I mean by that is if we have 
not just one source task, but a set of source tasks? Can we optimize for the ability to quickly learn these tasks such that we can learn new tasks quickly as well? So if we learn how to quickly learn um, a set of tasks already, that means that we should be able to also learn new tasks quickly. And so you could also think of this as, um, if we think about learning as going from a data set to a set of parameters, um, and we wanna be able to learn quickly, then we could think about essentially trying to optimize for this function so that we can learn well, um, even with small data sets or even when we have a small compute budget. So that's the intuition behind meta-learning. Um, there's two different ways to view meta-learning algorithms. Um, the first is more of a mechanistic view and the second is more of a probabilistic view. Um, related to the idea of kind of optimizing that learning process, you can, the mechanistic view is that um, you can think about a deep neural network that takes as input a data set and makes predictions for new data points and you just want to optimize this deep neural network using this kind of form of metadata set and optimize it over those tasks so, so that if you give it a data set for a new task, it can give you parameters for that new task. So that's the more mechanistic view. That's how you might kind of implement one of these algorithms. The more probabilistic view is if we have a set of source tasks, we could try to extract the shared knowledge, the shared structure from those tasks in a way that allows us to efficiently learn new tasks. Um, and so then when we have a new task, we'll try to use that prior knowledge to infer the parameters for the target task. So um, with these two views in mind, uh, I wanna try to first kind of talk a little bit about this probabilistic view, which will help us think about what it means for task to share structure, um, and then we'll go back to the mechanistic view. Um, cool, so let's start with the probabilistic view. Um, think about what, uh, what Bayes would think of meta-learning. Um, and for this, it'd be helpful to go through the graphical model. So um, to start off, uh, how many of you are familiar with Bayesian networks or, um, or equivalently directed graphical models? Raise your hand. Okay, and how many of you are not familiar with Bayesian networks or directed graphical models? Okay, it's about 50-50. Um, so Bayes nets or, or graphical models are covered, they're covered in CS 109. Um, and so for people who did undergrad at Stanford, you probably have learned about them, um, although you may be a little bit rusty, so we'll, we'll kind of walk through it a little bit. So um, in, uh, I don't know if I, I think I'll call them directed graph or gra graphical models in general. Um, they're often called Bayes nets as well. So in graphical models, um, random variables are denoted with circles. So if we have a random variable x, uh, we put x in a circle. Um, we may also have an, a separate random variable y. Um, so these are just two different random variables. And uh, dependencies between random variables are represented with arrows. And so for example, if you have a, um, a distribution p of y given x, um, this arrow kind of represents this dependency. Uh, and if, for example, this is equal to p of y, that means that there is actually no real dependency on x and so you wouldn't draw an arrow here. So actually, I'll, I'll leave that up. So now, um, the other thing about Bayes nets is that it tells you a little bit, you can read off kind of whether or not two variables are independent. And so if you have, maybe you have a Bayesian network that looks something like this. Um, you can look at this and figure out if two variables are independent. So um, for example, a and, um, a and Y are not independent from each other because they have a, a line that connects them. Um, and A and B are actually also not independent because they have a path that kind of goes from A to B. And so any set of variables that have a path between them are not independent. They have some dependency. 
Whereas if there's no path between them, then those two random variables are independent. So for example, A and D are independent from one another. Cool. Um, so that's a, kind of a very, basically all you need to know about graphical models, um, at least for now. So um, now I want to draw um, what I'll call is the graphical model for single test uh, learning. So in particular, uh, say we have some parameters, um, some labels, and some, um, some inputs, then we could think of having a graphical model of basically to predict y, it's going to be a function of x and our parameters because uh, you can, we have this kind of relationship of f of y given, um, given x and, uh, and phi. So you can think of this as a graphical model for, um, for single task learning. Um, I should also note that um, if you are thinking about causality, sometimes people might, um, this arrow, or the, the kind of relationship between x and y, uh, you could possibly like flip these arrows um, to be in different directions. Uh, but for the standpoint of this lecture, uh, it'll be helpful to consider this direction. Uh, and we won't really be considering things from the kind of causality standpoint. Um, cool. And you can think of phi as essentially the parameters of, of y given x. And these are the parameters that we're going to be trying to infer in machine learning or in, in single task learning. Now, actually, okay, I lied. There's one more thing that's helpful to know about graphical models. Um, and this actually may not have been covered in, in 109, um, which is what's referred to as plate notation. Um, and in particular, if you have multiple data points, so say this is just one input and one output, then it'd be nice to have something that could kind of denote the entire data set, not just one input and one output. And so that's called plate notation, which is that instead of drawing um, all of the different data points, uh, which would take me a long time, um, we'll instead kind of draw a plate around here. Um, we'll have an I here that will denote that this plate is over I, and this means that um, basically this makes copies of everything inside the plate, um, indexed by I. Cool. Any, any questions on, on this graphical model? Does this make sense? So now, um, if we get into multitask learning and think about the graphical model there, um, first that means that we're going to have multiple tasks. And so we're going to have, um, well, it can index the tasks by J. And then we will have another plate around here, which will just mean that um, we have multiple tasks that, go, that are indexed by J. So, phi j is the parameters for task one, task two, task three, and so forth. And these parameters have some shared structure. And in particular, there's some dependency on these parameters um, by theta. Yeah? Why does y only depend on phi? So y depends on both phi and x. So there's an arrow from phi to y and x to y. Uh, or rather like, okay, but y exists without phi, right? Is y our prediction or our label? Y is our, our um, this work is a little bit messy. I guess y, so y is the label and phi is the true parameters. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. What is the relation? Is there a relation between i and j? Because the plate on j like goes over the plate on i. Yeah. So you can think of um, i is over data points, j is over tasks, uh, and so this means that for every task there is another. There is a set of data points. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Why not be true, right? Because if you want to do like the same data points. Are. Yeah, so you may actually have something where like x is outside of this plate. It's, it's more like, um, actually no, so yeah, th th it may not be true. Um, and so this is the, the more general case where they're, they're different, but in, in practice, and I'm actually not sure how I would draw it if I were to, yeah. it's a little bit tricky to draw. 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, is theta in this case just like the kind of like a unifying model that is able to do all of these different tasks? So theta. Theta is kind of an interesting thing. So theta is, um, you can think of theta as this shared information between the tasks, and it's only the share, only the stuff that's shared between the tasks. And um, I use the word latent here because latent means unobserved. So um, in particular, the data points um, x and y are observed, and so. In graphical models, if you shade something in, which is a little hard to do on whiteboards, um, that means that they're observed. Whereas we don't observe the true parameters and we don't observe what the shared structure is. And so it's worth mentioning that if there is, if there is no dependency here, then that means the tasks don't share any structure. Whereas if there is some dependency on the shared structure, then they, um, they do actually have some, some shared information between them. Yeah. How do we need to create all the data points? Like the, aren't this x random variable all like samples that are being sampled from the random variable x? So why do we need to plate around that? Um, I'm just using this to denote the, the kind of individual data points in our training data set. Um, Good question. Um, yeah, so you, you could alternatively think of x and y as the um, as the random variable, like the random variable x and the random variable y. Uh, and in that case, you wouldn't you wouldn't need the plate here. You would still need this this plate, but you wouldn't need this plate. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so is this like the equivalent of a discriminative model since you're taking x, like the x of i's is like a given, and like a more general case, is there also something else, like some noise effect can be x of i's or something like that? Yeah, so there could be cases where there's other things that affect x and other things that affect y. Um, I'm leaving those out for simplicity, but um, for example, y may not be perfectly, like there could be some noise that affects y if you have label noise, for example. Um, there could be other things that affect X, um, but I'm, yeah, for simplicity, I'm leaving those out. Cool. Um, so the um, here I just drew, kind of drew this like um, for the the training data points. Um, it's helpful in some cases to actually write it out in a way that separately represents the test data points, um, and I mentioned that because. Um, the, the test data points are not fully observed. Um, it, the labels are not fully observed. If you have a set of training tasks, then you can observe the labels for the training tasks. Um, but we'll, we'll go into that more in a future lecture. Um, but now let's, let's get into a little bit about theta. So um, if you condition on the shared information on theta, then it's worth noting that um, the task parameters uh, well, so first, um, the task parameters are not independent right now because there's a kind of a path between them. Um, but if you condition on theta, the task parameters become independent. Um, and so what that means is that if you condition on theta, you'll actually have um, a lower entropy distribution over your, your uh, task-specific parameters, phi i. Compared to if um, compared to just your kind of prior over phi i, and so what that means is that um, well actually no maybe I'll ask you this so um, so if you can identify if you know the shared structure if you can identify the shared structure theta then when should learning phi i be faster than if you didn't know that shared structure. Have I can also walk through this slide a little bit again. So I guess um, the first step is that if we condition on, on, the, on this variable, then um, these become independent. Um, and if you have information about theta, that, uh, that lowers your entropy estimate of, of phi because the, um, 
essentially the, um, you can kind of narrow down what the value of phi is once you have information about theta. And so from there, um, if we can identify information about theta, then with this dependency, learning phi should be faster because we have fewer bits to, to uncover from our training data points. Yeah? As long as you really understand the relationship between theta and phi, right? Yeah, so if, if, you have if you have information about theta and this dependency exists and you understand that dependency, then learning phi should be faster than if you didn't have that information. Exactly. Um, basically, you need fewer, less information about the data points um, to infer phi once you have information about theta. Um, one other thought exercise um, that builds on this a little bit more is, um, so, so we talked about how if you have information about theta that tells us, that lowers our entropy, that gives us more information about phi. Now, what if the entropy of phi given theta is zero? Yeah? We already have a more than form on the tasks. Yeah, so if, if basically if it's, if um, your entropy goes to zero, then you actually fully know phi. You have, like, um, you have full information about phi. And at that point, you can actually just fully solve the tasks. Um, yeah, and that means that you don't even need any additional data to solve the task. Cool. Um, so in general, I think that this, this sort of Bayesian perspective, um, I think is a useful framework for thinking about what it means for some task to share structure. Uh, and specifically in the kind of the form of, of, of this variable here. And you can think about these kind of different mathematical relations um, as when we might expect um, basically how much shared structure is versus how much data you need to learn a given task. Cool. Um, two other exercises, um, or well, one exercise with two examples. So um, say that we have a set of sinusoid tasks. So uh, task one is um, um, a sinusoid with uh, an amplitude of like five and a kind of a phase of, of pi. Uh, and then maybe task two is an amplitude of one and a phase of um, pi over two or something like that. Um, and all of your tasks have different amplitudes and different phases. Then in that scenario, what information does, does theta contain? Yeah? Different amplitudes and phases? Um, not quite. So, so the amplitude and phase, this is, this is for task one, this is for task two. The question is, what is, kind of, what is theta? What is the shared structure between them? Uh, yeah? Like the fact that they're all sinusoidal? Yeah, exactly. So everything but the amplitude and phase. So it, it kind of is, um, corresponds to the, fa the family of sinusoid functions. Um, that once we have that shared structure, we just need to infer these two values using our data set. Um, one more example. So say that we, um, our tasks are machine translation, uh, and our goal is to translate between two languages, and one task is to translate from French to English, another task is to translate from Japanese to Spanish or something like that. Um, in this case, what, is, what does theta correspond to? Yeah? So you're saying it's possible translation between any pair of languages? Any family of two languages. Um, so basically, like, basically would allow you, like, you're saying that the shared structure is kind of a universal translator? Yeah, that's, that's close, although not, not quite. Yeah. Universal language rules. Universal language rules. Yeah, so you're saying things like adverbs and verbs and stuff like that. Yeah, so this is, I guess both of these are like mostly right. Um, it's basically going to be everything, um, and I guess, I mean, sort of the first one too. 
it um, basically tells us information about um, the family of all language pairs, although it shouldn't contain all of the information needed to translate between um, one pair of languages because, um, well, ideally it should be the things that are, they're only the things that are shared and not the things that are needed to, to actually solve the task. Yeah? So with that, can you give a small list of parameters since languages are so diverse? Yeah, so this will be, um, this will be like relatively small. It won't include things like vocabulary uh, of a given model, um, but it will contain things like adverbs and like, like, like the kind of grammatical structure that you often see in, in languages. But isn't that also very different across languages? Um, Right, so the specifics of like what, like what order do you put, do you put the adjective before the noun or after the noun, those sorts of specifics won't be contained in theta, um, but the general notion of those things um, is, is somewhat shared. This is also sort of a hard question because it's something that's rather vague and hard to put into words. Yeah? So if you like, translate this sort of setup into something like a network structure, would this, would theta be like the early parts that are all shared between yeah, so the question was um, like in practice, what is like does theta correspond to like earlier layers or like what is this theta thing? Um, so here we're really like just thinking conceptually. Um, in practice, uh, this can it can correspond to a number of different things. I chose the notation theta and um, I chose the notation theta in part because one thing it can represent is the initialization of fine tuning. Um, you can think of it as kind of, the initialization as kind of prior knowledge or kind of source shared structure. Um, but we'll see this much more concretely when we get to the lecture on Bayesian meta learning. Yeah. Uh, so previously you are referring to the task and the learning task, but the same thing. Oh, and is a meta learning task and a task equivalent? Or? Oh, um, yeah, so this, this graphical model will be the same for both multitask learning and meta learning. Yeah. Anytime you, this is basically the graphical model for a set of tasks. Um, it doesn't really cover, and, and both multitask learning and meta learning consider a set of tasks. Yeah, so this last part, um, so what does entropy of zero mean? So entropy of zero means that you, um, your distribution over phi is basically just um, deterministic. Uh, it just has a single value. Whereas if we had a, a non-zero entropy, that would mean that we have some uncertainty around phi. We, our distribution would be a wider distribution. And so when the entropy is zero, that means that we know exactly there's only one value that, it, that the distribution covers. There's only one value that the random variable can take on. And so in this case, when the entropy of phi given theta is zero, that means that uh, phi can only take on one value once we have the information in theta. And that means that we kind of have already, that means that once we have this information, we can fully recover um, the parameters for all of our tasks. Yeah. Yeah, so you can think of meta learning as basically trying to infer theta. So it's trying to maximize for the ability to learn a new task. And when we have a well, ideally, if we like, it'd be nice if we could just get phi directly. But if we're trying to optimize for the ability to learn a new task, um, given a set of tasks, the best that we could do is recover theta. And once we have theta, then um, that will allow us to learn new tasks from that distribution um, more quickly. Yeah. So, yeah. So basically, um, yeah, you can think of meta learning as trying to infer infer theta. Yeah. Yeah, so you can think of meta learning as trying to learn inductive biases or trying to learn sh like structure. 
And there's separately choices of structure that we build in ourselves as humans. And those can be represented, um, I guess the, the way that I might represent that is by having some, uh, some other variable here, which is like the human built-in inductive bias. And that maybe also has some prior over, like maybe we have, we have some guess at what phi is. Um, and that's gonna, this will kind of denote that sort of guess. And so, yeah, something like that. Yeah. Is that phi is independent on conditions on the task? Because uh, I can imagine a situation where uh, we're, we're training where there's like three main tasks. Two of the tasks are very similar to each other, but, but the third one is like completely different. So there's like so there's no shared knowledge in in theta uh, that's universal across all tasks. But still like uh, so so in, in this case, would phi one and phi two still be like dependent on each other? But like yeah. I, um, so you're saying that in the case, so this, is, this isn't a problem with two tasks. You're saying in the case of three tasks, um, there may be scenarios where um, there may be scenarios where um, the, like there's a lot of shared structure between two of the tasks, less shared structure between the third, and then kind of the least common denominator is pretty small in that case. And so then when you condition on that, the first two tasks are not independent. Yeah, so I think that when you, um, yeah, I think the cases like that end up getting more complicated. Uh, I think it's cleanest to think about in the case with two tasks. And when you have more than two tasks, um, yeah, it's a, yeah, a little bit more complicated to think about. Um, happy to discuss that more like in office hours. Cool. We have about five more minutes. Um, trying to think about, so let's talk a little bit about the mechanistic view. Um, and yeah, we won't. I don't, we may not quite finish it, but we're going to start. We're going to talk a lot more about meta learning next lecture. So um, it's okay if we don't finish. So um, we covered this probabilistic view, which is trying, which is meta learning as basically trying to recover this shared structure, or recover this data. Um, for the rest of the lecture, we're gonna talk a little bit about the mechanistic view. Um, and Bayes will come back later in the, the Bayesian meta-learning lecture. Cool, so um, from the standpoint of the mechanistic view, um, say our goal is to classify images. And we have, in this case, a really tiny data set of five examples. And our goal is to take this training data set and classify new examples. So Kind of going back to our conceptual view, these are going to be kind of examples for a new task for x and y. Now, um, if we want to solve this task from scratch, it won't work very well. And so we want to have, we want to leverage previous information. And specifically, if we have data from other tasks, then we should be able to use that to help us solve this few shot classification problem. And in particular, what we can do is we can um, take data from other image classes and construct them into tasks, each with their own train set and test set. And so in particular, um, here might be one task where instead of classifying things like lions and dogs and bulls, um, our task is to classify like birds, pianos, mushrooms, and a different breed of dog. Um, or in this case, we can construct a different task with its own train and set and test set where our goal is to classify between landscapes, gymnasts, um, and carousels, for example. Um, and so on and so forth. And what we can do is we can construct all of these different tasks, um, ideally lots of different tasks. Uh, these will be used, these will be using a set of training image classes. And we want to construct them in a way that allows us to learn how to quickly learn each of these tasks such that when we're given examples of new image classes, we can also learn a classifier for that task. Um, so you can think of this top process as the meta training process where we are kind of learning how to learn these tasks and the, the bottom part as the meta, test, meta testing part where we're trying to learn a new task. Um, this is an example with image classification where all the tasks are these uh, these image classification problems, but you can replace image classification with really any other kind of machine learning task. 
So it doesn't have to be an image task. It could be a regression task. It could be a language generation task. It could be trying to learn a skill. Um, really, any of the kind of tasks that we saw before in multitask learning could also be used to replace the tasks here. Um, now, the, um, then kind of more formally, the goal of meta learning is to try to, given data from a set of tasks, try to solve a new test task more quickly, more proficiently, or more stably. Um, oftentimes, in a lot of the use cases we'll see in this course are to try to learn more quickly with fewer examples. Uh, but in principle, all these ideas could also be trying to optimize for other aspects of the learning process, like um, performance and, and the stability of the learning process. Um, now, one really key assumption here is that we're, we have a set of training tasks. We're going to assume that our test task is drawn from the same distribution as our training tasks. And so, um, in particular, we'll have some broader distribution over tasks. It can be a little bit hard to think about what a task distribution is, but there is some broader distribution over those tasks. And we need to assume that the training task and the test task are both drawn from that distribution, such that when we're given enough samples of our training tasks, we can naturally expect to generalize and learn a new test task from that distribution. So this is analogous to the standard assumption in machine learning, where we assume that our train set and our test set are drawn from the same data distribution. Um, and like before, we, we probably want these tasks to share structure. Um, if this task distribution is a completely random distribution, then we won't expect to be able to learn a new task because these tasks are drawn completely from random. Um, cool. And then the task can compare to a number of, can actually correspond to a number of different things. This can basically correspond to the same kind of task that we saw in multitask learning. Uh, and one example that we'll see in homework one is uh, to recognize handwritten digits from different languages, where we may want to be able to recognize new digits that we haven't seen before. Um, I'll skip through this for the sake of time. Um, and I think we'll skip the terminology too. I think that we can cover the terminology um, in, um, in Wednesday's lecture. Cool. Um, so to start to recap, um, in this lecture we talked about transfer learning and meta-learning. Um, we only got to the very beginning of meta-learning, but in transfer learning the goal was to solve a target task after having solved a source task. And you can think of meta-learning as a subset of the transfer learning problem where we have a set of source tasks, and we want to um, transfer information from that to a new test task. And so really, it's basically the same problem, except we're going to assume that we have not just one source task, but multiple source tasks. Um, generally, in both of these cases, it's fairly impractical to access data from the source tasks. Um, and in all of these settings, we want to have some sort of shared structure. Um, and then we'll skip some of these two slides. Um, yeah, and then to kind of provide a recap beyond just the problem settings, um, today we talked about transferring via fine tuning by initializing and then optimizing on the target task and trying to be careful not to destroy the features that were initialized in the network by using a smaller learning rate or by training the last layer first. Um, we talked about this graphical model, which can give us some conceptual intuition for what it means for tasks to share structure. Um, by having this statistical dependence on this shared latent information. Um, and then lastly, we talked about how meta-learning is aiming to try to actually infer what this shared structure is and use it to learn tasks more quickly. Um, cool. Um, so that covers the plan for today. Um, in terms of the next lectures, the next five lectures will be on really core methods for uh, meta-learning and unsupervised pre-training. Um, and these will also be covered in homeworks one, two, and three. Um, and then, yeah, lastly, a couple of reminders. Homework zero is due tonight, so make sure you, you get that in.